My name's Murray McRae, and uh, I'm a strategist with uh, Creative HQ, local business incubator. I'm an engineer by trade, if we go back far enough, so uh, building and fixing technology was what I was about. But at a very early stage, I got very interested in the market. Went away and did a business degree and got involved with new product development. And that's what you guys are doing, developing new products. But I did more than just develop the products, I was involved with the launch strategies. And then later on I got involved with relaunching catastrophe, so I spent a bit of time rescuing products that had been launched and failed, so I've experienced with what does and doesn't work. Um, and after a period of time I did that, I went to university and got another marketing degree. So I've got marketing degrees to paper the ball with, and I've been spending 10 years in the startup space. Um, so I've got a good understanding of what it takes to do this. I've run my own startups. Uh, I've mentored many, many startups, probably getting into the hundreds. So I've been doing this for a wee while. So first off, we're going to have the sponsors' um, slides because, of course, I'm here, care of Creative HQ, so you're going to see a couple of slides about us, and you can fall asleep during these if you like. Um, but I'm going to do them anyway. Um, so if you've got an idea, Creative HQ works with the brightest minds, helping them turn their Ideas, technology, innovations into commercial success. We're really about the business. We're about high growth, export oriented scalable businesses. Things that can go big. If you fancy you've got the next Google, next Facebook, I don't know, next Cloud, whatever you feel that you're into, then we're part of that. Next iPad. Um, anyway, are we any good at this? Yes, we're getting better and faster with every year. Businesses that have come through us are growing on average at the rate of 40% per year. And this is people that are between four and seven years old. So they're still growing strong after many years. So this is not off a base of $5 this week and $10 next week. Right. So the Bright Ideas Challenge. We're all here because we've got a great idea and we imagine that we can make some money out of it. And the key to success in the Bright Ideas Challenge is where the strategy that you've been working on now meets marketing. Because all the thoughts in the world are no good unless you start communicating it. Right. Just a little reminder of one of my little ethical sort of statements, one of my little policy statements. Good strategy and good execution in market decreases the risk that your product will not sell well. That is, if you haven't got a good strategy and you don't execute that strategy, as opposed to get distracted and just do cool stuff, do the strategy, execute it, then you stand a greater chance of success. There's lots of university evidence to this, you know, but my evidence is the people who don't execute a sensible strategy just fail. They run out of money, they get lost and lose momentum. So, what have we learned so far on this journey to launch our bright idea? I'm going to go over what some of the other people have been talking about because you've seen some very wise people here. Those that were here during the time we talked about business models, they, um, they talked about who pays. This is really critical in go to market, is to remember who pays. Who's going to pay you for this product? And what are they paying you for? That's that product definition. What on earth are they actually paying for? I know this seems really obvious, but I want it to burn in because you can lose track of what it is that they're buying. It's really critical. And, and in terms of who are they paying? Are they paying you or some intermediary? You know, like do you have someone else involved in this supply chain? And why are they buying it and paying that price? Is it because they perceive that it is worth a thousand dollars even though it only costs you five dollars to make? Is it because if they don't have this, they can't use this other device they've already bought? Is it that it's just so damn sexy that you couldn't walk down the street without one? What's the reason? And this last one's quite critical when we start looking at the channel. Where does the money flow from? Okay, so these are things that you've learned in earlier presentations and they're very critical. Just a little reminder about the risk. Now, risk, when you were watching the slides, if you came along to this presentation where risk was discussed, we <laughs> risk, everything's risky, why do I have to listen to this? But some of these elements are very important when you go to market. 
like understanding where the revenue comes from in terms of its margin and volume, because how many hands can you have in the chain before you, nobody's making any money? How much volume at a particular price do you have to get before you're paying all your costs and actually making some money and can pay a wage to yourself and pay the bank back, break even? And scalability. Does it cost you $9 to sell a $10 product? You know, is your cost of sales such that scale, scaling this, this channel, this go-to-market strategy is going to be very costly? And investment. How much cash in the bank or cash do you have to come up with every month to fund this business until it breaks even? Really critical aspects when you're in your go-to-market strategy. We'll talk a bit about all this stuff later, but I was just reminding you where you're at. So, this was probably the last of the refresh slides I wanted to remind you about. Right, so we're going to develop our cool idea over here. We're going to do it in our little lab, actually on the kitchen table, or in the shed, or in the basement. Then we're going to think of some way to build it, and in your case, in the back room, on the kitchen table, in the basement. <laughs> and then we're going to distribute it in a big truck, or online, or in the back of the 20 year old Toyota like me, um, to somewhere, perhaps the retailers, to customers. And of course, if you're on the web, and I spend a lot of time with web based businesses, you're almost all of those things, or at least you imagine you're all of those things, but you'll find when you dig into your business model that in fact there are people involved in these phases. You've got development partners in here helping you build the product because you haven't all the skills. Down here in the factory where you're delivering it, you've got a telecom company, you've got a, perhaps a, um, a, a web server facility that you're using. Down here under distribution, you're using Facebook and Twitter and various other things to communicate your idea and uh, using uh, the interweb to uh, uh, distribute that product by way of downloads. Just remember that you're not, you're not doing this, there are other people helping you along the way. And of course retailers, uh, take all sorts of forms. You have to think in terms of a web product. The structure still exists for you, even if you're a web product. It's just that you know, some of these people are in disguise. They're not called retailers. But they have that role. They have that role. And of course, who are these people down the end here? Are they very important? Who are they? Customers? Can't go anywhere without customers. And by that I mean people that pay you money for your service. Right. We did market validation as well. Oh, I've got one more slide here. This one, about what's already been learnt. <laughs> Consumer validation taught us the idea of the minimum feature set. Does anyone can give me some sense of what this means? Can someone tell me what the minimum feature set is? Dead silence. Down the back here. The, um, what the features that you require in your product to get it to market that the consumers will want to take the product with. Yeah. And no more than that, yeah. which is the critical bit. And my little test for that, and, and I didn't invent this, but it's a really useful one to know, if you're absolutely embarrassed about how your product looks, then you're probably about right. If you're really pleased with the product, uh, the competition's already got the jump on you and you're probably screwed. And I think that applies in many cases even with fixed products. There's a few products where you have to be careful I don't think I'd be putting in an 80% uh, uh, quality or aqualung or parachute, but there's a lot of uh, braking system, new braking system for cars, I'd probably want to get it pretty good. But in terms of those other things, you should be wanting to get out in the market promptly. Remember this minimum feature set, the benefits that come from that minimum feature set, they constitute, whoops, we'll go back, they constitute the value proposition for your yeah, the value proposition for the customer. That is what they're going to buy. They're going to buy the benefits that, that accumulate from the sum of those minimum features that you put out there. Those features might be fast delivery. They won't be necessarily always function in a piece of software or function in a little machine. They could be just fast delivery. They could be good terms. They could be good prices, but they're part of that feature set. Right, halfway. So, any questions?
Any questions? Dumb silence. The little trick I use when I used to do lecturing is I stand here silently till someone asks me a question, so we could be here for a while. And I can outweigh you guys. Understood the minimum feature set. The feature set, right. The question was what is minimum feature set? Yeah. Um, just to expand on that, and we'll go back to the slide just to. Um, the minimum feature set is what you would have discovered when you were doing market validation or talking to the kind of customers that would buy your product potentially. And they would say, I would like it to do this, this, this. And this, you know, the list of things they think it would do. Uh, armed with those lists of things they would like it to do, you would have more than likely made some kind of prototype. It might have been just a PowerPoint presentation, which you showed back to them. It might be some kind of looks like model, that is, it's a, you know, stuck together cardboard and then painted so it looked like the real thing, but wasn't. Or it may, in fact, be a handmade model of how the product would really be. Even a web product, you can make a product look like it really is, but behind it there's nothing. Um, it would be something like that, which you would have tested, and they would have said, yes, that's exactly what I said I wanted. That looks good, and I'm prepared to pay this sort of money. That becomes your minimum feature set. The reason we talk about minimum feature set is the inventor can always think of good things that could be added to the product. Okay? And they add, Andrew Chen is an inventor, as the creator of these wonderful ideas, to add more and more groovy things beyond what the customer said they wanted. And that's why we always advocate market validation, so you don't make the perfect product for you, and then to discover that you're an outlier in the population and there's not enough people like you to justify it. Sometimes making something for you is the perfect strategy. But it's slightly risky because of the fact that you don't know that you're the biggest cohort, the most valuable cohort in the market. It'd be much better to go out and ask who wants to buy it. That's the concept of minimum feature set. And because I've got a little moment, no one asked any, many questions, I'll tell you a little story. I worked for Telecom New Zealand a few years ago, many years ago, and uh, I got involved with a product that had failed in the market. It had been launched three times, and all three times it had failed to fire. They'd spent $40 million on this product. It's long enough ago that I can talk about it. Um, and they were making absolutely appalling revenues off that investment, something like $90,000 a month, which was really, really bad. They were really, really distressed. And because uh, I was a bit of a young, bushy-tailed young man, I said, I can fix that. Turned out I didn't have a clue. But I got introduced <laughs> to a very clever man who understood these kind of problems. And we borrowed the boss's car, and we went for a road trip. We drank a lot of wine, all the wine areas. We went to every whoppy place, Gisborne, New Plymouth, little places where we had salespeople all around the country, South and North Island. And we came back and we discovered some things. That the engineers had got very excited about this product and all the cool things the software could do. And it enabled 64 odd features. What we discovered is of those 64 features, they liked about 10 of them were keen, really, really keen on only about five of those ten. And there were seven features that it didn't have because no one had asked them what they wanted. And so having spent 40 million, I had to go upstairs and talk to some people who shouted and banged the tables and swore at me and all sorts of things about how stupid can we be down there in marketing. Um, and it was really like that. Some of the words were just incredible. But eventually they allowed us to have another um, four million create those seven new features. And so we confounded the engineers by calling it version 4.7. They were very confused because the version before had been three. But we just had our own little secret story we were playing there. And we did that and we launched it. And within nine months, it was doing a million a month instead of 90,000 a month. I came back to work for that company 10 years later. And somebody had opened up the cupboard, saw all these groovy product features that we turned off thought, oh, there must be money to be made in all these features, had enabled them all and the product was failing. Listen to your customers, only execute what they really want. Don't put bells and whistles when you start out, it'll slow the boat. The boat will go slower the more you 
embellish it. Heavy boats, heavy race cars don't win races. And um, it'd be good to hear Ed, because Ed might even disagree with me, and that'd be fun. What about features that you can enable that the customers at the outset don't know they want? But as soon as they discover it, they love it. The question was, what about features that you know are going to be very useful for them, but which they don't yet understand because they're perhaps so revolutionary that they haven't yet contemplated them? I think the answer to that lies in the uh, earlier thing I said about market validation. Take that idea in some conceptual form, <coughs> maybe it's in a PowerPoint or a little scenario where you say, we use some personalities. Mary is a housewife and she goes to the cupboard and opens the door and takes it out and you describe how the benefit of that product would be. And if you get positive benefits from that, you no longer have your dilemma because you've got people who are saying, I love this product feature and then we include it. It's a fallacy that you love it, they don't know about it, they will like it. But however, it's very simple to test for it. Very simple. Very practical processes for doing that. Hi. How would you go about How would you go about um, making sure that you allowed for them? Is that what you're asking? Um, if, if we made it so it was operational and it had the minimum feature set, but it could do more, then um, when do we, we add those? Ah, good question. The question is, if you have lots of groovy features, when should you, should you bring them live or, or allow them to be available to the customer? I think the first gentleman's aunt, the answer I gave them is part of the story, that is when you're comfortable the customers want them. But there's also that thing about inertia and, and the boat go faster. In the beginning when you first launch your product, you want to get as many customers on board as possible rapidly. And that usually means focusing on narrow niche of people with very specific needs and then finding lots of them that clone that. As your product matures, the only way you can continue to grow is appealing to a wider bunch of people. And at that time, once momentum is starting to slow within that single niche, you want to add them out. So there'll be a time when you'll feel momentum slowing. The other time that this will happen is when you sense that the competitors are going to get the jump on you. And a good strategy, if you're very clever and you understand where the markets are going, is to build features and keep them on the shelf. And when there's a sniff of the competition who comes out with a new feature, you launch yours. And if you continue that strategy, all the time market validating them quietly in the background so they are what customers want, you can keep undermining the business model of your competitors. I had a good friend who did that. He worked in a business um, and he's been very successful as a multimillionaire these days. But he did that all the time. He had this idea about his next product sitting, validated and built, and he launched it in time with the market response. Because you can be too soon in the market and just die with it because the demand isn't there, which is part of your area. You can be too soon in the market, but you can be too late. It's, there is a certain amount of luck or serendipity in these things. So I'll just move on a bit or I'll be in trouble because it's probably got a plane to catch or some such thing. Right, so go to market. Um, essential activities. I was really stuck how I was going to do the proper lecture. I was able to, to you know, paraphrase what everyone else had talked about and then I thought, what am I going to talk about and sound credible? Because I realised there was this challenge between people who had fixed products who went through conventional distributors to, to, to retailers Perhaps there's a little angle on their product, but it's still fairly much in the traditional mould of being built, shipped and sold. So this is necessarily very generic. Generic. So think of this as the framework and you'll have to dig into it for your own product. And I'm really emphasising the core principles of what you do rather than what you would do in one industry. I'm very much in the web, and I could have told you all about how to do it on the web, but um, I, I think that there's a broader range of products being discussed at this group. So you must have a distribution mechanism. I know it sounds really obvious, but 
this product is not going to fly out the door just because you put it in sto store or build it or have it on your website. It just doesn't go anywhere. You need some kind of mechanism to get it from yourself to the end customer. Might be through a retailer, by a distributor, might be direct to a retailer, might be your own shop. You must have incentives to drive the channel. Margins and promotions and competitions and little commissions for the various people who are helping you along the way. Because in the beginning, you might be able to control a few people to help you out, but it's not a scalable system. You've got to have a system which allows the cash that comes in to be distributed in some part back to the people who are doing the job for you so that they continue to work and help you sell your product. That's just as obvious from the web. You've got to have some way to incentivize those bloggers that are going to say famous things about your product. You've got to have some way to stimulate people to tell their mates and do the whole viral thing for you. You've got to have some money to pay for Facebook ads or Google ads, whatever you're doing on the web. There is always someone that needs to be paid if you want to have a scalable system. And you must have some promotions to communicate your offer. And by that I mean, in the promotions I mean in communications. You've got to find some way to communicate that you've got something to sell. Um, I have a sort of pipe dream that I want to become uh, the manufacturer of high performance parts for old cars. It sounds very weird, but it's because I have a bit of passion for that. And I've been thinking for a long time how I'm going to communicate that. And so for me that's going to be in a lot of forum where um, people talk about their old cars and hotting them up and making them go faster. So I'm going to be thinking about those. I'm going to be thinking about whether those forum I might have to pay for banner ads. I'm thinking about whether I might make commissions for performance shops and engineers to sell my product to their clients when they're modifying the cars on their behalf, so they sell my product and they get a commission. I'm thinking about all those things. But in that process I'm imagining what my promotions will be. My options are fairly limited because there's 10 customers for some products in New Zealand, maybe a thousand in the US and you know maybe 500 in the UK. It's a very limited and disparate market so I, I've got a big job ahead of, my net, of myself but that's why I like it, because it's not a very good business model and I have to be clever to su succeed with it. We need a product. You notice the product underneath it, I've got a price and a kind of call to action. I'm just reminding you that your product is just not the physical bit here. The product has other characteristics. It has a price and it has a call to action. That is, why I want one now? What's the value proposition for an iPhone, iPhone 4, what's the value, what would, why would you want to buy an iPhone 4? What's that? Communication. Status, usability. Status, Status. usability. Apps. Apps. <coughs> Desire. It's become very sociable. Goddamn sexy, isn't it? No. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that screwing is like narrowing down what you can do and controlling us. But that's what people have done forever, you know. Why does perfume cost, you know, a few hundred dollars for half and a fluid ounce, you know? It's because we've been convinced that it's sexy and you must have it. Think about those things in your product. Not exactly a call to action, but why are we going to buy it? Yeah, the call to action is buy me, I am sexy. Um, so let's have a little reminder about distribution. Is it out of the van? Is it in your shop? Is it in someone else's shop? And how do we get there? Because one shop, you're not going to make your fortune. Maybe it's 10,000 shops. I recently was involved with helping a company with maternity lingerie. You know, that's nursing bras. And uh, really hard work trying to find enough nursing bra shops in Wellington to become gazillionaires. We had to go around the world and find distributors that dealt with 
material in the shop. And then we discovered that the really big people got their own, got it made themselves, had their own brass, you know, the Marks and Spencers didn't buy own brands, you know. Are we gonna do it online? Is that our only channel? Or is that just our starting channel and we have a different strategy? And do we need some sort of intermediate tree? And Spellchecker and Microsoft can't decide what the right spelling of that is, and my 13-year-old son couldn't help me last night, so if that's the wrong spelling, I apologise. Um, intermediate trees, they're those guys that facilitate what you, what you do by passing the product on, by, by um, helping customers get in touch with you. Sometimes they might be um, a retail portal on the internet, they might be um, a distributor who has warehouses and things. Might be a person with a van that goes around uh, the trade route, you know, selling ice cream into um, petrol stations and dairies. Just remember what your ones are and how you're going to engage with that. Uh, market intermediate trees. The things to think about these guys is they're looking for some kind of terms. It's a deal, it's a business to them. So what are the terms you can offer them? And how do they apply with what the industry norms are? Sometimes you don't get much choice about this. It's all set up. You pay what the going rate is. And if your costs are so high that you can't make a buck, then that's your fault, not their fault. They're not interested in helping you make a profit at their expense. They are happy to go along for the ride if you've got a good product, good marketing strategy, and can give them good margins. And you have to deliver the pricing that they're comfortable with. Some sort of volume sales, they're not interested in tiny little niche products that take more admin than they deliver in terms of profit to them. And they're very interested in collateral, that is, all the sales material, like how do we sell this, what are the case studies, you need to prepare all that sort of stuff. And this is true of web products too. Although in those cases you're delivering the collateral by way of a little download or a little page to the end customer potentially. Someone will look at your website, want to know who loves using it and why, those kinds of things. And some kind of selling incentive if you, is important. I put this note for myself, marketing in the channel, my experience, that I, what I've discovered. I, I, I ran a mobile phone company for a wee while, um, many, many years ago, this really dates me. When Alcatel mobile phones were really the thing to have, they were the thing to have in New Zealand because I was in charge of it and we were very successful at marketing and we went from 0% to 30% out of the consumer market uh, for mobile phones in a very short space of time. How did we do that? We did this by this, marketing in the channel, it's my little, this marketing in the channel. What we did there was we went and talked to the quality control guy and we talked to the sales people on the, in the telemarketing rooms and we talked to the account managers and we went and talked to the, to the um, um, Vodafone, it was Bell South then, but you know, the, that's how long ago it was, um, to the Vodafone retail dealers. We put in place the right kind of uh, warranty, right kind of everything, so we did that. Now, how are we going for time, team? Have I run out of time already? Yeah? Um, and do you know what happened? Every person along that line got what they needed to do their job well and feel satisfied, you know? We had competitions for microwaves and all sorts of stuff. The quality control <coughs> guide, whenever a product failed, we guaranteed to replace it like for like in a minimum of 10 days. We had, we had a whole lot of no... Um, no arguments, no, you know, no fighting kind of things. Got a problem, we fix it. We did all that stuff in the channel and the channel did all the work for us. It cost us money, but we got 37% of the market in less than 12 months. Nearly put Motorola out of business in New Zealand. Right. Um, I can say that because my mate was in charge of Motorola and we drank quite a lot of beer together at one stage and it he fessed up that things weren't going that flash. Um, marketing to customers. You've got to not only market in the channel, but you've got to market so there's demand in the channel. 
They'll have greater confidence in what you do if you're using conventional distribution. If customers come and knock on the door, they say, oh good, not only are we getting paid a good incentive, but customers are coming through the door, I don't have to work too hard. And that creates a kind of synergy, particularly in the early days, where they practice making sales, they build confidence in making sales, and they want to make more for you, because that becomes their new money tree, where they're going to get the money from. Right. How do you do this? Because that's all in theory, that's good. That's what a university lecturer would have told you. How do we do this in practice? Well, if you start up, the key thing to do is trial the product with some customers. Right? If they like it, you can ask them to pay some money. Yeah? And that's a good start point. Sounds pretty simple and basic, but even that is quite hard. But if you can do that, you're starting. More trialists, more chance of convincing them to <coughs> pay some money. And then when you feel like you've got enough of the bugs or out of your delivery and other kind of systems, then you can start thinking about, you know, formally everybody paying. This is true even with a, with not true of all fixed products, but there's many sort of hard products you can do this with as well. You might trial it in one store, limited volume, where you can only do little batches because you're making them in the back room. Um, needing to make 20,000 and put a $300,000 advertising campaign around them is not the realm of the Bite Ideas Challenge, I suspect. So we will be trialling things and making things some way. And get feedback on what they like and don't like and try and meet their needs. See if you can tweak it in any way, shape or form. So this would be really good. Do you think you could put these boxes of tin in a stronger box because these boxes fall apart and collapse and we can't stack them tin high in the warehouse and it's such a nightmare. Or in terms of software, this is all really good, but could you get your PayPal thing to work properly because, God, it goes into some kind of black hole whenever I push the go forward button on step three, you know? You learn these things when you've got that out there in trial and it will happen. Anything that you can't imagine to go wrong will go wrong. Anything you thought would go wrong will go wrong as well. And just basically everything will go wrong. Um, and if you do that, if you do what's on that page, you will learn so, so much. If that was the only slide I put up, and we talked about that all night, that would teach you a lot about this whole go-to-market thing. Because from this you'll become knowledgeable about what they want, what they don't want, in terms of uh, volumes, in terms of incentives, in terms of what price works, any feature and functionality that doesn't work in the channel or with the customers. Part of the startup thing, you can start trialling with customers directly, just selling to people you know and getting them to trial a product. Then you can do that same trial with a distributor. Say, hey, I'd like to, I've got some customers. I want to see if you'd like to trial this product and see if it'll go through your channel. Do the same trialling in the channel and then sign them up. You don't have to go this huge step all the time of going the full way. Um, retailers, the best way to go to a retailer or a distributor is with sales in hand. So I'd recommend if it's possible to make sales before you talk to distributors, because they want some case studies of success. You could say, I've got 10 customers, or I've got 100 customers. Um, I'm selling to them at this price. That should allow you to have this margin. You've already got a story. And here's some case studies on my website or on my little flip chart explaining how, the, how customers love it. That will get you a long way in your go-to-market strategy. Case studies, examples of sold. But you're going to have no money. Of course, startups never have any money. They have lots of money, but it's never enough. Sometimes they have very little money, and it's definitely never enough. So don't be afraid to push and use relationships. Try to get endorsements, like off. If your neighbour's a famous person, it wouldn't hurt to say, hey, what are you doing? You fancy endorsing my product. The, the lingerie company, you know what they do? They found a model that looked like Angela Lena Jolie, who just happened to be pregnant. And it just created such a buzz on the channel. 
and they used her for two seasons, and it was very successful. Um, be cheeky and persistent. The worst that anyone can do would say, go away, you're a pest. Well, you've already burnt your bridges there. And being polite is not going to help. Well, being polite helps, but, but going away and not being persistent is only hurting you. It's not really hurting anyone else. <coughs> be cheeky. Some people are shy. It's hard to be cheeky. I find that really hard. I'm quite a shy person. But um, it's important. And listen and ask. Listen to what they say about your product and then ask for something every time. I often tell people when they're going out to do market validation to both ask what they want and then when you finish say, look, can you recommend someone I should talk to that could help me with my business? And I make all the companies I coach ask that question every time they meet with somebody and they usually get a name and get passed on. Right. Let's go on. Now, am I out of time now, Kath? Well, I don't know how long I'm supposed to got to go to. Um, no. Huh? A um, couple of minutes. We better be quick. It's all right. I can be quick if I need to be. Risk areas. And motivated channel partners. We've already talked about that. If you've got a whole lot of people that are absolutely essential to your business model and you haven't got the right incentives or motivation or excitement in place, that you're not passionate about what you do, then no amount of heavy lifting by you will make it work. The cost of holding stock if you've got product will cripple you when you're growing and you're going fast. So if you can think of innovative ways like Jeremy does with Icebreaker, where everyone else owns the product, he just gets to sell it. They can't sell it to anyone else. He's got the manufacturers holding product on behalf of himself. Helps a lot with cash flow. Helps with that problem. Competitors undermining your profit in desperation or because they've got bit deep pockets, they start discounting and hurting you. Or amateurs coming into the market who don't understand the cost structure who just undermine you. The trucking industry is like that. Some guy goes to the bank, gets a mortgage on his house, buys a truck, hasn't got any business, undercuts the guy next door, starts a spiral of undercutting until nobody's making any money. And running out of cash. You run out of cash before you get to break even, then you just basically might as well have just got to re cash set fire in the backyard and not start it. That's for real. Think about that. Right. Allocation of your money. This is a bit of a surprise for some people. <coughs> if you've got some money, say I've got $100. I wish I had $100. I've got 10 cents. But if you've got 10 something, 10,000, 10 dollars, 10 million, right? Then what would you do? Well, market validation. You should probably spend about 5% of what you spend on um, product development on that. Just checking to see whether anybody actually wants this product. It's a very cheap exercise. It could save you a lot of money. Of course you do it before you build the product. Okay? Anyone discovered that? Built a product and have gone out and done a bit of market validation, the product's no good and we've got to start again? No one in this room? Heroes. That's the usual case as you go out there and discover you've got it wrong and the product needs massive redevelopment. Once you've done that, you've validated, built a product, and you go to launch it, you need about the same amount of money that you use to develop the product for marketing for the first 12 months. Pretty rough and really rules of thumb. Gives you a bit of a sense of where the hell you've got to go. Let's move on. Just a reminder, and this is one of the other slides from uh, David Allison from the other day, a colleague of mine. This is all going to cost a whole bucket load of money. So we need to think about where the money's coming from, how we're going to plan on spend it so there's money coming in each month. Like, don't spend more money than you've got and dig yourself a hole and you're not be able to pay your bills because it'll just result in some kind of death spiral. Think hard about that. If you've got customers, make sure they pay you. They've got your goods, why haven't they paid you? And keep thinking about pricing. If you discount by a little amount in dollar terms, say two dollars, it doesn't seem like much. But if your profit's four dollars, you've cut your profitability by 50%. Now, 
if the product seems to be selling well, why not put the price up? Novel thing. Most people don't think to do this, but you'd be surprised how in New Zealand we tend to underestimate what people pay for a product and we end ourselves in a stupid discount spiral that does no one any good. And because you needed something to take away, so you felt like my uh, presentation was in use, and because I couldn't answer all the questions, and because my slide was very, my slides tonight were very generic, I wanted to give you something that would be food for thought going beyond here. So I dug out this uh, 22 go-to-market strategies, they're not really strategies, if anyone's had a look at them, they're little tactics, but they're really, really cool. Have a little look at it, there's some really groovy stuff in there. They're very lightweight. Anyone could achieve those. They do not require money, and they do not require you to be a genius, right? It's really easy stuff. And on the bottom, there's a link to half a dozen. Yes, have we got that? Did it print out? There's a whole lot of links that you could go to to learn more about go to market strategies. There's little templates, there's a range of things that might suit your own business. So, um, uh, Kath, we, has that gone up on the website as well? Is it downloadable? It'd be lovely if it went up because then you would be able to download and click on the URLs and go straight through rather than have to type them in. So, that's that. So, hmm, we're in the business of bright ideas and commercial realities here. I hope this has helped a little bit with your path along the way. Um, if you're interested in creative education, this is where this came from. The world starts here. But of course, this is part of the Bright Ideas Challenge, one of the greatest programs in Wellington. I just absolutely love being involved in it.